Hello and welcome. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS, and this is the Nutritionist Webinar. This month, we are delighted to welcome Heinrich Spangenberg of Westside Enterprises in South Africa. Heinrich was born and raised on a mixed corn, beef, and sheep farm in the Free State Province of South Africa. After completing high school and national service in the SADF, he obtained a master's at Free State University while he was employed as a junior researcher. Heinrich then moved to the Glen Agricultural Development Institute, where he managed the Beef Research and Development Program and obtained a PhD in animal science in 1997. Dr. Spangenberg has spent approximately 30 years in the animal science industry as an academic and commercial nutritionist, focusing on research, product development, and effective implementation of research. His most recent position before leaving the corporate world in mid-2017 was as Technical Sales Director of AFGRI Animal Feeds, a position he held from 2005. Before that, he was employed by, at Molotec Feeds as the National Technical Manager, Technical Manager, and General Manager at Meadow Feeds, as well as lecturing and developing the animal production curriculum for the B-Tech degree at the Free State University of Technology. Currently at Westside Enterprises and Westside Consulting, Heinry oversees all of the technical support and sales in the business while tracking new global development in animal science research and the latest trends in animal production. He offers consultation to provide technical support to find optimal ways of using the latest science and technology to provide innovative animal production solutions. Heinrich is married with a daughter and son and lives in Malmesbury. In his free time, he enjoys traveling, reading, gardening, and being an amateur cook. Good morning, Marion. I want to compliment you on doing such a great job with the nutritionist webinars. I believe we all have appreciation for that. And greetings to everybody attending this webinar. I hope I can master this virtual medium with the faceless audience and that you will find something in the talk that will be of value for you. I'm honored by the invitation, or maybe rather the bullying into this, but I have to mention that it is difficult for me to imagine my career without CNCS or AMTS, or maybe without the models and the nice people behind it. It goes back as far as 1997, if I remember correctly, when I first met Tom in South Africa with a CPM or a CNCPS training, can't remember correctly. And then I paid my first visit to Tom and Easy Acres and Cornell back in 2003. This is a nice photo of Tom, where I believe he's most comfortable amongst cows. This is a Photo of Easy Acres back in 2003. I was a release candidate back in the early days and also traveled with Tom on numerous occasions all over the globe, ruminating animal nutrition and doing workshops and presentations. And as you can see here, under various conditions, I really appreciate the journey and experience with the AMTS team. And I believe I thoroughly earned my hat. Congratulations with 15 years of excellence. And I hope you all the best for the future. Just as a matter of orientation, I live in South Africa and down here in the Western Cape, which is a Mediterranean region and well known for its wine production. Now my hometown is Marmesbury, which is approximately 70 kilometers north of Cape Town. This is a nice photo of Cape Town with Table Mountain in the background, Devil's Peak, the Lion's Head and Signal Hill, Green Point and Sea Point. And as I mentioned, it is a Mediterranean and wine producing area. So this photo taken from a famous wine estate known for its Pinotage, which is a truly South African red wine. Marmesbury is in the Swartland region, meaning black land. And the name probably from this dark 
colored rhino bush, which is indigenous to the area. This is uh, an early morning photo of Marmesbury. And uh, this is some photos of the areas uh, around Marmesbury. Now, this region is probably the food pantry of the Western Cape with vineyards, olives, small grains such as wheat, barley, oats, vegetable, and canola, and also cattle and sheep in mixed farming systems. Oats are predominantly for silage production for our dairies, and to the best of my knowledge, Marmesbury District has the largest TMR dairy cow numbers in South Africa. So we offer wine or milk if you prefer olives, bread, cheese, lamb and beef. And if you have a craving for veggies, we offer chicken with the numerous broiler farms in the region. South Africa has a sophisticated livestock industry and for that matter, dairy industry, which is backed by a sophisticated feed industry and well-trained technical advisors and nutritionists. Normally, feed companies do its own in-house research and development and in general put a high value on in-house training programs for technical advisors and nutritionists. So normally our research and development programs are backed with international technology agreements and then fast implementation of source technologies often puts us on the forefront of new technologies and development. Now, South African dairy farmers have the same challenges as elsewhere in the world with high feed prices and low milk prices and an overall unstable business environment. Dairy farmer numbers declined significantly over especially the past two decades from 7,000 in 98 to just over 1,000 in 2020. This graph shows the declining number of milk producers while milk production increased. And this graph shows that South Africa and the USA follow the same trend with declining producer numbers but milk production increasing. With that, we also have seen an increase in herd size. We are currently second in the world with an average herd size of 459 cows in milk and second only to Saudi. We know that farming is a challenging business and dairy farming may be more so. Those challenges also challenge the port industries and a strive for precision farming through new technologies. So in this case, maybe an attempt for more precise nutrition and feeding on a dairy farm. And all of this we do to improve profitability. The map down here may be not so clear, but just to give you an indication where milk is produced in South Africa. TMR herds predominantly in the Western Cape and a few up central and north. Large cow numbers on the southern and eastern coastline and Wazulu Natal, and these predominantly on pasture, I would say about 99%. Also, there is a tendency for dairy to grow in these pasture regions. So you will have anything from very sophisticated and high-tech operations to more standard type of operations, but the majority of farmers who wants to stay in this business invest in new technologies. So I be large operations with nice housing, double rotaries. Uh, you have all sorts of parlors and housing systems uh, for TMR and uh, pasture dairies and also uh, TMR herds in open pens uh, with and even without shading. The goods that drive South African agriculture, uh, and you can see that almost 50% of sales in the South African agricultural sector is in livestock with 6% in milk and cream. Now, today, we are talking about precision feeding and our view on in parlor fractionated feeding and the development of the program we use. 
Fractionated feeding meaning that we fractionate feeds into, for example, energy, protein, and in some cases also mineral components or fractions, which then is fed in the parlor separately and according to the specific needs of the individual cows. You can even do individual raw materials if you have enough bins. In this case, we have four bins, and that is for energy pellets, protein pellets, and it also allows us to feed steam up and fresh cow products with expensive medicaments in it in the parlor, and therefore minimizing loss of expensive feeds outside the feed box. So we want to make sure the correct concentrates get to the correct animal in the correct amount. And I will give you some background info on the development of the program, how it works and what we achieved. This slide is stolen from Tom. <clears throat> and I often make people aware that cows are amazing, very amazing creatures. And they supply us each and every day with superfood. So just to put things in perspective and to show you the energy output in terms of body mass for a 100 kilogram man, a 100 kilogram man running a 42 kilometer marathon and a professional football player. And you can see that these ladies do twice as much the work as these uh, people. So the cow is the uber athlete and we expect her to perform to a maximum athletic potential each and every day. But do we treat her that way? This is also stolen from Tom and um, this is from the early on AMTS training slides. And just to show you that body weight is very very important. It is the most important input in any program. And this is where body weight is used in the AMTS program. And you can see it is almost everywhere. So how did I get into this fractionated feeding or in parlor precision feeding? Um, we had an on-farm training workshop on this specific Jersey farm just outside of Marmesbury in July 2011. The name of the farm is Spreekstoel Dairy Farm, meaning pulpit, like in a pulpit in a church. And Tom did quite a number of these workshops with us. And we also had a technology agreement with me Preco at that stage. So, we did these workshops quite thoroughly, incorporating knowledge and experience from our technology advisor or technical advisors working in all regions in South Africa and from our sources in the United States and Europe. So sort of the best of three worlds. Two issues were paramount with this evaluation. First of all, the fact that the parlor was inadequate for milking the number of cows and that it was hard on both animals and workers. And secondly, excessive feed waste outside in the open feed pads and trough in this windy winter rain region. Remember that this is Mediterranean area. So we did a lot of financial exercises with different scenarios and especially because a housing system to combat the environment was constantly in our minds as well. So we really try and make the numbers work to finance a housing system instead of a parlor. In the end, sanity prevailed and the parlor was built with feeding troughs recommended by the Laval. So the installation of feeding troughs at that stage primarily to reduce the waste of expensive dairy meals. And I must say that back then I was not in favor of parlor feeding at all because of the possibility that rumen health would go downhill when you have two or three high starch meals for 24 hour period in the park. But I was friendly requested by the farmer to make this work. So the task on hand was to reduce waste of TMR and especially expensive dairy meals outside. So we want fewer visits by the bulk tanker, the company bulk tanker, 
and improve rumen health. Now, <laughs> I was already nervous it would go the opposite way with impala feeding. But also, on the other hand, the more dairy meal you have in the TMR, the better the chances for sorting. And we had and still have 60% plus dairy milk in our TMRs. So with wind, rain and mud outside in open pens, it is a recipe for slug feeding. So just maybe, fingers crossed, this can work. And third and most important maybe is to increase profitability. So it is fair to say that I was nervous at that stage. I just want to clarify uh, some terminology before I go on, because this is uh, not always the same all over the world. So if I talk about a daily meal, that is everything in the TMR or the diet except for the roughage. And then you can also have a maize free, which is the dairy meal without the maize or the corn. And then of course, either a, a protein concentrate or an energy concentrate. Now, in parlor feeding of a pelletized dairy meal is a common practice in pasture systems in South Africa. Anything from a 12 to a 17 percent protein pellet with high energy or more specific starch are fed and will depend on pasture quality. So normally you will have twice a day milking and therefore also twice a day feeding. And this can happen on a flat rate basis or according to milk production. Flat rate meaning, for example, six kilograms of pellets right through. In other words, three kilograms per milking or a specific amount for the low, mid and high production groups or purely grams per liter. So pretty much any dairy management system can handle this type of feeding because it is fairly simple. Afiki, however, took in part of feeding to a different level with the Afiki ideal weight feeding menus and which I will explain in more detail later. But in essence, you cannot use the system without a scale. If you don't have a scale on farm, you are forced to feed a flat rate of gram or grams per liter, even with the Afikim. So weight is very important. And like in this case, you need a scale. So just remember Tom's slide, weight is everything. And then setting up the ideal weight menus or making changes on it is time consuming. And time consuming is not something I like. But back then, in 2013, the other systems, all of the other systems, lack efficient or comparable feeding systems or feeding menus. Then, approximately at the same time, I also got involved with another Jersey team I heard that commenced on parlor feeding on a grand per liter basis with heavy feed. Now, I just want I just want to make something clear. There always were farmers feeding in parlor. Maybe a little dairy meal or a handful of corn, but that was more like our comfort issue than anything else. It's totally different uh, with what we're busy here. So I started on this farm with one kilogram in the parlor to get the cows going. And this is just a photo of the Effie menus for straight forward gram per liter feeding. It's not the ideal weight menus. You will put in a minimum yield where cows start to qualify for feed and then grams per liter of milk produced. So you therefore feed as a result of milk production. Very important in this case, you feed as a result of milk production. Then you will also put in the minimum and maximum kilos allowed for specific groups. Feed per hour and of course in how many portions, twice a day milking or three times milking. And this could also be very easily set up for Alpro or any of the other systems. So this is an example for a 25 plus liter group. We formulated and supplied a base mix outside the feed troughs to maintain 20 liters 
milk production at 100% primary intake. Then a minimum of three kilogram pellets in the parlor, she gets three kilogram minimum pellets in the parlor if she qualifies. And in this case, from 18 liters or so from 18 liters, she will get three kilogram pellets. Then she will get 500 gram per liter, which effectively kick in from 24 liters because she already got three kilogram minimum. So if you take three kilogram at a feed efficiency of two, in other words, two liters of milk for every kilogram of concentrate, that's six and 18 plus six will give you the 24 liters. Then a minimum or a maximum of eight kilogram is allowed, which will be 36 liters with 100% base mix. And if she consumes 110% base mix outside, that will give you 41 liters. The amount that you can feed in parlor also depends on the number of milkings per day and the time spent in the parlor. The need for production groups diminish when you feed like this because the base mix is the same for all animals to maintain a base production. So you decide what base you want to maintain. And this is pretty much the same than with pasture herds, where the pasture is the base feed and you top up in parlor or on a feed pad after milking for specific production targets. So I decided to duplicate this on the farm, on Flexstool farm, which then just built the new parlor with the feeding troughs. Um, I did not contemplate developing a new system uh, at that stage or at this stage at all. So um, we were just feeding per liter of milk and I already saw things happen that set my mind racing. The production increased, manure looked excellent, and all over we had healthy cows with good performance. So why not try and do something really good with this? Why not try and just take it to the next level? Because you see, precision feeding and precision farming are terms commonly used, and it is precisely what it says. We want to do things more precisely for better profitability. So if I have different feed components, for example, pellets with the emphasis of energy and protein and maybe minerals, coupled with a feeding menu, a dairy management program on farm and the internet, you can do quite a lot. And don't forget you need scale. So back then I thought a lot about this and in animal production systems, the objective is maybe to have healthier animals with excellent immune systems cost efficiently and that to ensure optimal production, reproduction, sustainable and with longevity. And then this can ensure better profitability. Now, we had the AFIC feed ideal weight system and which is a very good concept but just remember it is ethic in specific and it is very time consuming to set up and also when you have to make changes and especially when you experience bad internet connection. Helpro and all the rest of the management systems was not satisfactory and basically systems for flat rate feeding or gram per liter feeding, very basic. And Elpro was what I had on pre school farm with the new part and feeding troughs. So we want to develop, at that stage we decided we want to develop a new system. And with this in mind, science, our experience and a focus on outcome must be easy and quick to make changes offline or online. We want to run it in the cloud and it must be a applicable to all dairy management systems. So this is very important. It must be applicable to all dairy management systems. This is just a, a screenshot of uh, a part of a menu, one of the parameters uh, what you have to set up in the FEV 
feed menu system so it is there's a whole lot of it that you need to prepare and then you enter it on the farm in the heavy feed uh, system and uh, if you want to do that from home remotely and you have bad internet connection it is really a slip we set a rough goal we wanted to develop a program for precision feeding of individual lactating cows and steam up cows in the parlor and this must work for all dairy management systems we wanted to improve on the ideal weight feeding model of AFI, even if only to make it easier to manage and we wanted our system to be quick and easy so we wanted to use this tool to meet nutrient requirements on farm as close as possible to exploit genetic potential, to maximize efficiencies, and to increase profit in the end. Our focus is on lowest cost per kilogram milk produced, not low cost diets, but rather income over feed cost. I will come back to feed efficiency. What is really cool about this is that the, the opportunity to reformulate very quickly for changes on farm. You don't have to wait for the next bulk load to make changes effectively. So you don't need to make changes in the feed factory on your formulas and then wait for the next uh, load to arrive on the farm. You can operate real time by changing the ratio of energy to protein pellets and the amount of concentrate fed. <clears throat> I had a few issues in the back of my mind when we developed this. I want to get as close to perfection as possible with the transition and high cow package. And there is a number of things that you can pay attention to, but what constantly pops up is negative energy balance and primary intake. Yes, nadir and turnaround time, body condition, rock reaper, etc. But the primary intake impacts all of it so through observation observations on farm and many 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 published papers we know that early lactation is physiologically unique and when nutrient consumption really meet requirements and therefore create a negative energy balance and the magnitude of negative energy balance varies but nadir usually occurs within the first 10 to 15 days in milk and cows return to a positive energy balance around day 30 if things go well, but up to 100 days in milk if not so well. With optimal transition management, the first ovulation occurs 7 to 15 days after the nadir of energy balance is reached and the first ovulation can therefore be expected by 22 to 30 days after calving with a range of 70 to 42 days. So the majority of first ovulations are rarely accompanied by the concomitant obvious expression of estrus due to energy balance. Generally, the first ovulation is often followed by a short luteal phase and a 10 to 12 day interval to second ovulation. The second ovulation is in general accompanied with a more obvious expression of estrus behavior and chances for conception increase as the number of cycles that have passed before insemination increase. If you take 385 days in the calving period as optimal, then you have more or less four cycles to get a pregnant. So in essence, we want her not to experience severe nadir and we want her to recover quickly. The next couple of slides from Dr. Ron Butler as presented at CNC 2012 and smack down when we started with this. So the proportion of cows ovulating will be higher for cows when body condition loss is less than 0.5 points opposed to when body condition loss is higher than 0.5 points. We have 80% ovulating opposed to 40% at 45 days postpartum. Also, the 
proportion of pregnant cows will be higher when first ovulation happens before 50 days, very important, before 50 days in milk, opposed to when first ovulation happens after 50 days in milk. And at 25, 125 days postpartum, 70% pregnant, opposed to 40%. Yeah, this slide indicates that conception rate declines as a result of increased milk production. But as a matter of fact, variation among cows in negative energy balance is more related to feed intake than milk production. If you look at this for cows on the same production level, ovulating cows had a higher primary intake during the transition period than non-ovulating cows. Feed efficiency, back to feed efficiency, it is a very important issue for profitable dairy farming. It is also a very important issue for feed manufacturing companies because on-farm competition between feed companies are often determined by feed efficiency. But high feed efficiency is not necessarily beneficial in the first 30 days in milk because cows with a high feed efficiency, as you can see here, has a longer delay first ovulation because of more severe negative energy balance and delayed ovulatory cycles results in lower fertility. So the bottom line is that I producing cows that increase trimatic intake to better match the energy requirements for milk production will have better energy status and improved fertility. This is a table to demonstrate the effect of feed efficiency. So feed efficiency at the top in milk per kilogram primary intake and milk production on the left, the primary intake required at the specific feed efficiency to reach the milk production. But I just want <clears throat> to demonstrate by means of a simple calculation how I see the whole story. Don't worry about the RAND because it doesn't matter what currency you use, the result will be the same. In this case, 59 to the dollar, 40, 60, 59 to the dollar. So as mentioned, feed efficiency, very important, as you can see from the calculation, with the milk price at 7 RAND per liter and feed price at 580 per kilogram, 1.1 feed efficiency versus 1.7 feed efficiency results in a difference in income of 4 and 20. So we will therefore always aim for the best feed efficiency we can get. But let's say we have a fresh group or cow with 1.7 feed efficiency and a dry matter intake of 25 kilogram. So that will result in 152.50 income over feed costs. If I manage now to get her to eat another one kilogram of dry matter, and only at a feed efficiency of one. Therefore, she consumes 26 kilograms for 43.5 kilogram milk. The feed efficiency drops from 1.7 to 1.67, but I still earn 120 more. And I benefit all that I mentioned previously about primary intake, negative energy balance, etc. So what are people doing that prevents a milking cow from eating another mouthful? Or what can you do to encourage another mouthful? Just remember, she is an uber athlete. This is a very busy slide, but which I used on many occasions. And if you don't want to prepare a whole lot of slides, you can just bring this up and talk the whole day. We normally see milk production over here, something like this, and body weight over here, something like this, with dry matter intake, something like that. So if we, if the focus is entirely on milk production and especially peak production without particular attention to dry matter intake, you will have a large drop in body weight or body condition, which is often more 
than 10% of body weight or one, condi or one uh, body condition point. And this you will often see with inadequate steam up or imbalanced fresh down diets. So when we developed our concept and product package for that season on high cows, the idea was to focus on dry matter intake and the energy package and maybe drop a bit back on peak production, but to have better persistency over the lactation. Also to try and reduce body condition drop by 50%. So going from example, one body condition or uh, uh, body condition point or 10% body weight drop to only 5% uh, drop or 0.5 points. We got the dry matter intake and energy package right and lower body weight drop, but we saw increased peak production and with persistency. And that paid for the expensive transition package. It is difficult to sell this concept, such an expensive concept to farmers. But if you can guarantee payback, then it is uh, an easy seller. I believe <clears throat> that it is common knowledge uh, now that oocyte health and embryo quality is very, <clears throat> is very much determined by negative energy balance or the degree of negative energy balance. Ovarian follicles developing during negative energy balance may be detrimentally imprinted. So if you get dry matter intake right, as mentioned in the previous slide, you will help a lot to have healthy ovarian follicles and healthy oocytes with good embryo quality. Prepartum differences in dry matter intake, energy balance and metabolic hormones are associated with postpartum follicle outcome. Very important. So full follicle development requires many weeks for completion and at least 84 days before ovulation, the primordials already starting to develop. So it starts smack down in the dry period. All of this is part of what we know as epigenetics, which is a topic on its own. But so you can do the good, the bad, and the ugly to influence how genes are expressed and therefore hamper or enhance genetic potential. A few objectives that we had in mind for the development of this. Uh, first of all, that it must be a low management burden resulting in improved efficiency and increased profitability. We want to ensure cows do not lose excessive condition post calving resulting in improved fertility and less metabolic disease problems. Negative energy balance must be addressed. And we wanted to drive all cows off with a perfect body condition score of three and a half to ensure the foundation is set for a good start to the following lactation. In parlor feeding of one or more feeds to read to, to eat <clears throat> more feeds to each individual cow's exact nutritional requirements, irrespective of breed or palate, uh, parity. And then also very important, um, nutritionally set maximum levels as a percentage of each individual cow's body conditions or corrected weight within the program to ensure that concentrate is not supplied at harmful levels. So <clears throat> this fractionated feeding program takes into account a whole lot of parameters, but I just want to bring your attention to milk production as a percentage of body weight, milk weight, and concentrate as a percentage of body weight. Concentrate weight to precision feed animals on a percentage of body weight with a detailed feed menu. So milk production as a percentage of body weight and then concentrate as a percentage of body weight. So why do we take milk production as a percentage of 
body weight and then feed the concentrate or dairy pellet as a percentage of body weight. Why not just feed a flat rate or certain grams per liter as explained earlier when we started with this. This is part of a feeding menu used in the program and just for the purpose to explain the concept. At the top here, we have the concentrate that will be fed as a percentage of body weight and milk as a percentage of body weight, lower value and upper value. For example, if this cow has a milk production between 4.75 and 5% of body weight, she will receive 1.7% of body weight concentrate in the parlor. And in this case, if she produce 6.75 to 7, she will receive 2% of her body weight in the parlor. But what you cannot see on this, unfortunately, because I didn't have the space to do it, on the left hand side here is the ratio in which the concentrate will be fed. And in this case, energy to protein. And you can do anything that you want with that ratio. In this case, it is 75 energy to 25% protein for the lower production and 70 energy to 30 protein for the higher production. So it's just a matter, in this case, a matter of um, production. At the top, <clears throat> we have body weight. So this is part of a feeding menu and at this side, it is just a few calculations to explain differences between body weights. So at the top, we have body weight, milk production, protein and energy concentrate or pellet, and then the total fed, and then gram per liter as well. Same on this side. So this is for a 700 kilogram cow, and this is for a 500 kilogram cow. Just to explain the differences between cow size. So let's first look at flat rate. From the total fed numbers, it is obvious that you cannot feed a flat rate because the concentrate requirement is changing too quickly for milk production. Also, the requirements are vastly different between body weights, whether it is for the same milk as percentage of body weight or purely for the same milk production between different cow sizes. When you look at grams per liter, on this line where we have 5% milk produced as a percentage of body weight, the grams per liter of milk is the same, doesn't matter the body weight. Same down here, 7% milk produced as a percentage of body weight. So on the same line, different body weights, different milk production, we have the same grams per liter. But that number is also constantly changing, increasing as milk production drops, and vice versa. So the question now is where will you pitch it when you feed grams per liter? Furthermore, there is also a difference between different body weights, but for the same milk production. A 700 kilogram cow producing 35 kilograms of milk will receive more concentrate in parlor opposed to a 500 kilogram cow producing 35 kilograms of milk. Therefore, if you group cows on production only, you either overfeed or underfeed, hampering production potential and body condition control, just to mention two. So if you group cows on production only, you either overfeed or underfeed. With the same days in milk, this 500 kilogram cow is more efficiently producing 35 kilograms milk at 7% milk weight with 10 kilograms concentrate than a 700 kilogram cow with 35 kilograms milk at 5% milk weight and 11.9 kilograms of concentrate. Therefore, this menu allows us to feed according to the objectives as I mentioned and to minimize under and overfeeding, but rather to be more precise on the requirements for production, growth, body condition, etc., and with a huge, huge financial benefit. 
I just have to mention um, that when we kick off with this, and I saw the amount of concentrate some of the Jersey cows consume inside the parlor, plus what is offered outside, I got scared. You just look at the bottom here. So I phoned the farmer and told him that I expect a few cows to die on that specific day due to acidosis. So he pulled them and checked manure, cut full, etc. Nothing. Healthy, happy line, smiling, ruminating. And that, with 30% starch, still 60% plus corn in that diet. So in my mind, it is difficult to have acidosis in fresh and high producing cows when the steam up or transition foundation is done correctly. I did many, many, many exercises on AMTS when we developed the program. So we looked at history on TMR and pasture uh, milk production, uh, dry matter intake required to reach started, body condition scores, uh, compensatory growth, we developed growth factors, etc. And I just want to show you a few things on these spreadsheets. So first of all, we pulled or we get hold of all the data that we can to see what's happening on milk production as a percentage of body weight uh, on specific days in milk and to see what, what the results for uh, averages, uh, what's happening on the lower side and the higher side. And I put all of this into AMTS to get a feel for the milk production and what you need to feed in terms of concentrate as a percentage of body weight in the parlor and how we uh, could improve on this. And we've done that for TMR and pasture herds. Then also we determined the dry matter intake requirements to reach body condition targets at different days in milk or days left to reach the target. And we've done that for different scenarios. So uh, for instance, or for example, when you increase both the base mix and the fractionated feeding protein and energy, or maybe just only the base mix and the energy part, or only the energy. So to do this, you need a starting point and the euphoria of starting points where you have a three and a half to three and a half body condition in indefinite days, so maybe not that good. A more reliable type of starting point is where you go from three body condition to three and a half in 216 days or uh, 120 days in milk. So um, I use that in one of the examples as a starting point with a 45 uh, lead milk production at a 27.2 kilogram dry matter intake. And then I wanted to see what's happening when I go from two and a half to three and a half in only 206 days. So when you do that, you stay on the same uh, dry matter intake, you will lose 1.3 liters of milk. And if you don't want to lose that, you need to increase dry matter intake by 700 grams and 260 grams of that will be the fractionated or the impala feed part. If you increase base mix and the energy, it will be 600 grams and 200 grams of that will be energy. And if you increase only energy, you need to increase it by 603 grams. So I've done that uh, also when you go from 2.5 to 3.5 in 106 days and the same, but only in 60 days and many, many, many more. So all of this was then summarized in this little table on the left 
days in milk and then days in milk left to reach body condition target at the top body condition loss where you have to feed more or body condition gain where you have to feed less and on three and a half body condition score nothing happens and the more she drops the more you feed as a percentage of body weight and for the first 120 days in milk or 216 days left you feed the same amount as a percentage of body weight for each and every parameter so as the dry as the days in milk increases you will need to feed a lot more to reach the target of three and a half body conditions for a dry off and that will cost you a whole lot of money so you need to get this right early on the same was then done for first lactation compensatory growth so we determined the extra dry matter intake required to reach target weight by second lactation if she does not calve on the 85 percent of mature weight um, and then we done that uh, maintaining or not maintaining milk production as for the, the previous slide and then we did the growth factor so we done all of this for first second and third lactation and third lactation so um we done this when she got at 85 percent of mature weight or 78 percent or 71 or 64 and so forth and it takes into account or allows for a body condition loss in early lactation and then a steady recovery towards the end so for each scenario then the concentrate you need to feed extra as a percentage of body weight to reach target weight and body condition at the end of that lactation now with our fresh cow program and products we do not want to lose more than five percent of body weight or 0.5 body condition points and we also don't want to feed for a very quick recovery of body condition because that will be unnecessary expensive so we then developed a base mix to feed outside in the feed bunk to maintain a specific average production and that is complemented with and energy and protein pellet fed in different ratios and incremental as percentage of body weight to reach target in terms of milk production, body weight, body condition, average daily gain, reproduction, etc. And then also very important fresh cow pellet for the first 30 days to make sure cows recover quickly from negative energy balance. Then we developed the menus, the program, and set it up to run uh, and update the LPRO feed tables automatically. And then of course, there is reports. So simple schematic is where we've done all the A&D cattle exercises. We've done the product development for the base feed outside, energy, protein, pellets, minerals, the fresh cow product program and feeding menus development. And then of course, the reports some of the features of this fractionated feeding program is regular relevant reporting and the use of specific preset targets and benchmarks and that helped to fine tune dairy feeding and body condition management products are balanced for precision nutrition and efficiency per individual cow in the parlor and this is feeding to meet individual cow nutrient requirements and not averages and then of course one product or several products in different ratios can be fed in the parlor and the name of the game is continuous improvement daily operation of this fractionated feeding program or the whole system 
you need to update carving weights, feeding groups, uh, the menu need to be set up correctly. And then there's a daily drop from the dairy management system and all of it is run in the program, in the cloud, and there's feed tables and reports. So let me try and explain to you how this works on a daily basis. Um, maybe uh, let me start with this. Um, so on a daily basis, the farmer or the dairy manager needs to update calving weights and, of course, body condition score, which is very important in the way the program is set up with body condition and target body condition growth, etc. He also needs to make sure that feeding groups are correct. In this case, we have a TML group, or you can have on the same farm, TMR groups, pasture groups, no feed groups, sick groups, etc. And then the nutritionist needs to set up the feeding menu. So this is only a part of a feeding menu, uh, just to explain the concept more or less. So in the first six days, you feed a fixed amount. You do not feed as a percentage of body weight because it takes approximately six days for all of these dairy management systems to create a valid uh, body weight. Then from day seven to 30 or 50 or 90, whatever you decide, you feed as a percentage of body weight, but not according to milk production. So this is where AMTS is a very valuable tool and you pull these cows into production and you don't feed as a result of production. And also very important in this first 30 days, we feed one kilogram of a fresh cow pellet. Then from day 31 onwards, she will go onto a normal menu if uh, she's within all the set indices. If she is underweight, she will go on to a rich menu, underweight or under condition. And when she is over conditioned, she will go on uh, over and over menu. Okay, so each and every day a report is created in the dairy management system which export data to the cloud and this daily data report is then imported by the program and run with the menu and all the other stuff and all the calculations and then export a feed file or feed table to the cloud and this file with the amounts of energy protein fresh cow etc pellets uh, to be fed to each individual cow is then imported by the dairy management system and it is executed or fit. So all the calculations within this program is done as a percentage of body weight. And then of course you have reports and it can be default reports or customized reports any which way you like. Uh, a few of the regular management actions, and I just highlighted uh, the most important for me here, is that you need accurately body condition scores for cows at calving and at dry off. You need to make sure that the feeders are calibrated and that you, make, you have to make sure it is continuously calibrated. And once per week, produce the benchmark report generated daily by the system, just to make sure you're on track with your own benchmarks. This is my own concise report expressing performance in two different ways. At the top, we have production expressed in kilogram and at the bottom as a percentage of body weight. And then I looked at the top cow, the top 1%, the top 10%, the top group and herd average. So here we have the total energy and protein concentrate they received in the parlor. And here it is 
expressed as a percentage of body weight. So the concentrate fed as a percentage of body weight is not necessarily calculated on the current body weight because current body weight with growth targets, expected dry up body weight, current body condition score and targets, and body condition score corrected weight, pregnancy, days in milk, for example, is taken into account with all the calculations this included. Okay, so the top cow in terms of volume produced 49 and a half liters of milk, which is 10.44% of body weight. The top cow in terms of milk weight produced 10 and a half percent as a percentage of body weight, which is 39.89 liters. The top crew, 35.2 liters at 7.8% milk weight is the same for both these parameters. And that may be because this is, is on fractionated feeding for a very long time. This, it is not always the case that the same group is stopped for pure production and as percentage of body weight. So in terms of production, these are quite nice numbers. These numbers are good or maybe excellent for the Jersey herd on twice a day milking. Uh, and the average for this specific day was 29.2 liters with a butter fat of 5.4 protein, 4.2. Okay, so in terms of milk weight, we initially aimed for at least 1% of the herd at 10% milk weight, and we now average 9 to 12% of the herd at a 10% milk weight. I aim for a herd average of 6.5% milk weight, and this would be easily accomplished if this herd was in a housing system. Okay, so just to give you an indication of AMTS prediction, uh, the actuals uh, for what is happening on the farm, and then if you take, take those numbers back into AMDS. Uh, I use AMDS maybe a bit different than most people. I like to formulate for the top cow, and the rest must follow. And this became more and more the norm after a couple of years working with this fractionated feeding program where averages are not something of interest anymore. So let's take a look at this. Um, the top cow produced 49 and a half liters. My initial formulation was 47.7 NE and 50.1 NP and when I took the actual back into AMTS, uh, I got 48.545 liters ME and 49.8 MP. I would expect this cow to milk towards the MP value, which she did. And this is just because of days in milk. It's a very you know, high producing cow. So I expect the MP and uh, she was close. She was close to that. So it is very accurate. These numbers for the top group and the herd average also okay in my mind, but it is not as accurate as when you work with one cow. So again, the top cow in terms of milk weight thirty nine point eight nine liters, very accurately predicted at thirty nine point six eight liters in MP. If there is anybody out there listening and wondering whether AMTS is worth using, go for it, you won't regret it. The model is as accurate and as accurate as your input numbers. This is just another example with Holstein and Jersey's on the same farm. And here you can see that uh, the top 1% cows 
produced 11.3 mil weight and we have almost 10 percent uh, cows producing uh, 10 percent milk weight the herd average smack on at six and a half where we want it to be and then the numbers for the jerseys more or less the same but with a lower herd average of six and again this is a, a, a herd in open pens and if we had a nice housing system for them these numbers would be much much better so what what are the benefits that we see? We want at least 1% of the TMR to produce 10% milk as a percentage of body weight and at least 1% of pasture to produce 8% milk as a percentage of body weight. But as you have seen in the previous slides, you can even do better. And because we aim now for 10% of the producing 10% milk weight, so we saw an increasing number and still see an increasing number of cows producing more than 10 percent milk weight it is important to realize that cows are fed for milk production and not as a result of milk production Cows are fed to minimize negative energy balance and metabolic disease incidences. And as a result of this, we improve reproduction, embryo quality to ensure offspring reach full genetic potential. Milk production as a percentage of body weight is improved with an improved lactation persistency. And there is a far better control on the waste of expensive dairy concentrates. Growth and body condition management is improved. And in the end, we see an improved profitability. So the outcome, in my experience, is that, first of all, the real impact is evident with cows calving into the system and after full lactation on the system. You will not really see an impact on mid to late lactating cows. You will only see it next lactation. Very important is that you will use less dairy meal. We use less dairy meal and what we use are allocated correctly. We've used 40 tons less dairy meal on this specific farm. 40 tons a month less. We've increased production with three liters initially and then another three liters and um, it is still improving. So the focus is on continuous improvement. So this slide shows the improvement in terms of milk as a percentage of body weight that we have seen in a specific pasture herd over time. On the left, first, second, third lactations, in the first column, is milk as a percentage of body weight on day 20. The second column then indicates the percentage of cows for a specific milk weight before the fractionated feeding program was on this farm. And the third column showed the improvement that was made after a year taking the last six months in the consideration. So it is evident that the 6% and higher milk weight at day 20 increased for all lactation numbers. In this case, 68.9 to 81.9, 77.7 to 93.3, and 53.6 to 73.1. What an improvement. This slide shows what happened with body weight in a year's time. The first column, we, we have weight at specific days. So this is previous year before fractionated feeding and these columns after fractionated feeding. And I am really only interested in what happened around day 20 to 40 because I want to see quick 
turn around of body weight after after nader of hopefully not later than day 15. So the first lactation turned around at day 20, which is really good, but they lost 79 kilograms, which is two points body condition. After fractionated feeding was introduced, they turned around at day 20, again at day 20, but with a loss of only 30 kilograms, which is 0.79 of a body condition point. But uh, I improved this with 100%. So I aim for 0.5 points. The same story with lactation two, and I am closer to losing only 0.5 points. For lactation three, the turnaround was only on day 60, and which improved to day 30, 40. They lost 1.4 body condition points, which improved to 0.79 points. This is an interesting slide showing what happened with weight change rate, weight change rate at specific days in milk. So the left column here is weight change from losing more than 20% body weight or two body condition points to gaining more than 10% body weight or one uh, body condition point at specific days in milk in the top row. So at the top, this is for lactation one and the bottom is for lactation two when they were lactation one. So it is the previous year before fractionated feeding was in play. The improvement is obvious if you look at cows losing between 10 and 20% of body weight. After fractionated feeding was introduced on this farm, that number decreased a lot. On day 30, we had 76% before fractionated feeding and only 21.34% after fractionated feeding. So to summarize, <clears throat> the fractionated feeding program is based on management by exception. Very important, management by exception. Fractionated feeding coupled with the AMTS model to predict dairy cow performance are valuable tools for on-farm precision feeding. But although AMTS can predict accurately for dairy cow nutritional requirements, the farmer still must rely on average feed intakes. On a daily basis, the manager of a dairy farm or the herdsman deals with between 1.5 to 3% of the herd that needs special attention each and every day. So again, it comes back to management by exception. We know that in each group being fed the same TMR, there are great differences between cows. And we know that these exceptions can reach 40% such as fat cows with lower yields, thin cows with high yields, cows that haven't reached the peak and cows which have peaked already. Now, this fractionated feeding system provides solutions to these problems which haven't been dealt with through normal individual feeding, thus compensating very high production cows and allowing them to reach their full potential without overfeeding others. The system addresses individual cow nutrient requirements instead of averages need for a group of cows, which results in under and over supply. So my take home message for you is to take full advantage of the production potential of cows individually. And maybe consider a feeding policy which considers more than one variable. And to contemplate feeding very expensive, uh, for instance, fresh cow products in the parlor, any expensive uh, dairy meal in the parlor, 
In this case, we did that with the fresh cow product here in the first 30 days, very expensive product. And then to reduce days open, the not pregnant days. Very important to dry cows off at the optimal body condition and body weight to ensure a healthy transition period and start off with the next lactation. And maybe, just maybe, better control of milk components on an individual level is possible with such uh, feeding um, regimes. So, furthermore, minimize the need for moving cows between groups and camps, which is very important for me. The use of a computerized self-feeding program allows keeping cows at various stages of lactation in the same group. Moving cows from one group to another is detrimental for cow comfort, which is the first limiting factor for a sound dairy operation. And then, of course, take better control of expensive feed components. To finish off, just a, a word of appreciation and first of all, uh, to Philip Shea, who is very knowledgeable on dairy management and dairy management systems, and especially Africa. This whole concept and ongoing development on a team effort and often spearheaded by Philip. And of course, after Animal Feeds, where I was employed when I started working on this, and the development of the program, and of course, my former colleagues who was involved in some way or another for testing and feedback and acting as release candidates. Last, but probably most important, uh, a dairy farmer, Mr. Tini Durr of Preexto Dairy, who more or less forced us to do this and did a whole lot to help us make success of it. Then all the farms and farmers that followed well, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to do this and please take care of yourself and your dairy athletes. Before we add on the question and answer period from our September webinar, I will briefly introduce our October speaker, thank our co-hosts and our webinar sponsors. Our originally scheduled October speaker, speaker, Daniel Scothorn of Scothorn Nutrition in Canada, had an unexpected conflict. AMTS CEO Tom Taluki, originally scheduled for November, will change places with him and deliver his talk, which is to be decided on October 14th. Daniel will take the November 11th time slot. Register to join us for the 9 a.m. or the 6 p.m. webinar, or both if you want to hear both, by visiting agmodelsystems.com webpage, looking under the Nutritionist 2021 webinar tab for the proper webinar sign-up button. I am thankful to my co-hosts who share the task of fielding questions and bring global insight to our webinars. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global, our co-host in the morning was Dr. Elena Bonfante, AMTS distributor and partner in Dairy Innovations with Dr. Bill Prokop. Tom Taluki also joined us for the discussion period. Our distributor in Turkey, Dr. Huday Kavusteran, also joined us. In the evening webinar, we were joined by Paula Afino of Afina, who hosts the series as El Webinar del Nutritionista. She receives support from Rock River Lab in Argentina and is ably assisted by Paula Alanis translating. We are thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production, hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Idina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Aginomoto, superior nutrition through amino acids, and Virtus, both of whom have sponsored us from the start. Also, the forage analysis laboratories of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, 
both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to ensure animal performance and micronutrients feeding the future. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max Purdue Agribusiness, Origination Inc., Phileo, Balchem, and The Milk Group. Each of these companies support nutrition and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. Following, you will find the question and answer period first from the morning webinar and then in the afternoon, the answer and question period from um, the Argentinian group. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, it, it was a very intense presentation, uh, but very interesting. So I will have something to uh, think on <laughs> tonight. So my impression um, is that, uh, of course, now uh, with this uh, system, uh, we are trying to simulate actually what happened with the robotic system. So trying to uh, implement the precision feeding uh, in a conventional milking parlor, if I'm not uh, wrong. And uh, I think that is uh, actually the best approach we can we have to start using. And um, uh, my first question is, uh, since uh, I've seen uh, uh, all... Um, uh, it is the not conventional milking part, but the rotary uh, in the pictures. Is it a system that can be adapted only to rotary or uh, uh, to conventional milking parlors? No, uh, can I answer? Yes, please. please. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just want to mention that Philip is also joining us for the uh, question and answer session. So Philip, feel free to jump in at any time if you would like to. Yes, so now it's not only for rotary systems, it's uh, applicable to all systems you will have seen and in, in the, uh, uh, some up there in the first uh, couple of slides that there's other parlors as well. Mm -hmm. So the main thing is it is um, the easiest and most cost efficient to put it in, in a rotary system because you will need more, um, uh, uh, conveyors if you if you are in a conventional system that's the short answer of that okay thank you and um, I saw that uh, of course the, your focus is uh, the um, calculation based upon milk production on body weight okay so do you consider the energy corrected milk uh, that's a good question yes if you have um, if you have like every lab, you have a system like that where you have real time uh, solids, mm -hmm. then you can use um, energy corrected milk. But otherwise, for now, there's not a many, many farms that have that system. So the only way that you can do that is on um, real time milk production. Yes, because that you do it each and every day. So you cannot wait for you know, for uh, milk analysis. And then you can just imagine if you milk 2,000 cows, how will you do uh, milk components per cow that quick? So uh, you, need, you need a specific system to do that. But I mean, that is something definitely for the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, about the body weight, uh, so you... Of course, it would be ideal to have the daily weight or at least uh, you know, more fre frequent data. Uh, but uh, as I understood correctly, do you think uh, the, uh, so the, the, for starters, uh, so the uh, weight at calving and the dry off is enough? Um, to consider the, these two measurements. Uh, it, it, do you mean, no, I'm not sure whether I understand that correctly. You use weight on a daily basis. So everything you do uh, regarding the calculations is uh, on a daily basis. So milk production on a daily basis uh, as a percentage of body weight, and then you feed uh, as a percentage of body weight. Um, so no, you don't, uh, you need a scale to do this. Uh, okay. to have daily weights. 
Okay, okay, so that's great. And uh, the last one, you mentioned the, that uh, with this system, uh, you uh, decrease the use of dairy meal. What do you mean? I don't know. Uh, maybe I don't know the, the word. Uh, a dairy meal? Yes. As I explained, uh, a dairy meal is when you, if you take the TMR, the full package uh, daily diet, and you exclude the roughage part, so then you will have a dairy meal. And probably uh, difficult for people in other countries, uh, let's take the United States, for example, to understand this because you feed such a great amount of roughage. So uh, where you will have something like 60 to 65, maybe 70% um, roughage in your diet, we only have like 30 to 35%. Mm -hmm. And anything from, I would say 60 to 70% dairy meal. So it is all the concentrate stuff. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Tom, I see you're unmuted, so that leads me to believe you're going to say something. No, no. Heinrich, Heinrich answered it right at the very end, what I was going to say. Okay. All right. Um, we did have a few questions, and please, anybody that um, has comments or questions, do, do jump in. Um, we did have a few questions that did pertain to um, the daily weights and the use of energy corrected milk. So I'll address one from Keats. A uh, few rob robot systems like Laley A3 are weighing cows and Delavalve has a body condition score camera, but how do you weigh and score cows in other systems or what do you recommend? Well, Philip, why don't you answer that one? I'll push the back to me. Um, in the case of the Afikim system, there is a walkover scale that, that weighs the cows at the end of every milking, either twice or three times a day, uh, and gets an average weight for the day. Uh, there, are other, there are other management systems that do provide uh, scales. In most cases, uh, people don't, most cases, the companies that provide it, the manufacturing uh, uh, milking machine manufacturers themselves don't understand the value of the scale. Uh, and, and, and if anything can be can be, can be gleaned from Henry's talk, it's the fact that the 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 real importance of the of the benefit of of having, having a walkover scale, being able to see where the cow's weights are at any point in time in comparison to starting weight and the intended uh, dry off weight. So it, it, the, the, the way the system works is to, is to utilize daily weights. It would be very difficult to use uh, a calving weight as an example because you then don't know what the, at what point the cow, at what point of weight and at what point in milk the cow reaches nadir and therefore can't feed according to that. So you need the cow's weight on a daily basis. Yeah, and let me, let me, let me follow up on that. It, it's as Henry pointed out in that slide, you know, even from a formulation perspective, and I don't care what formulation system you use, body weight is in, is everywhere. Uh, it, it impacts how we calculate requirements. It's how we predict intake, and, and we guess uh, most of the time. And, and what's worse is. Um, Mature weight on Holsteins has been going up about 1% a year over, over at least the last 20 years as, as we've selected for more milk. Same can be said for jerseys, any dairy breed. We're getting bigger cows and, and it, it makes it a bit more challenge, uh, a bit more of a challenge when we go to formulate if we don't know body weights. And, and unfortunately, uh, as Philip said, a lot of the times we see, you know, there's an option to add animal scales uh, in most of these, uh, for most of these manufacturers and they're engineers. They don't understand the power of having that number as Philip said, uh, but it's also uh, typically the margins that they put on for the price they put on for adding scales are, are crazy. 
And, and that's the first thing that people pull out of uh, pull out when they uh, are, are pricing a system is, well, hell, I don't really need a scale. I can save, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars by not doing that and, and never have any real concept of, of what they're missing. Um, and it's unfortunate that even lately has with the A5s, you can get, get the new A5s with or without scales. Uh, and and that, that was really disappointing to me when, when they started doing that. Um, we, we, you know, over the years, as I've talked to producers around the world that have had them, uh, had scales, I've had producers tell me, you could take out the daily milk weights, you could take out everything, but you will not take out those animal scales uh, because they felt they could pick up sick cows uh, one to three days earlier uh, because of weight deviations, primarily because the cows stopped drinking water. Uh, it, it's, it's a data point that, that we can get a lot of use out of. Thank you, Tom. Um, I am going to combine a couple questions. I think that Philip answered this one, but I just, um, it, it serves repeating. Do you use a scale at the entrance of the rotary parlor for this as, as, an, um, as an individual entrance? I think you said it was at exit, Philip, is that correct? Philip. I said it. I said it's at exit. I just need to clarify a point. In South Africa, we don't, we don't, we haven't used this our system on it on a robot. So we didn't design it for robots in any way. It was designed for normal, you know, normal parlors, uh, you know, in, in all ways. So in in our case, uh, we only know of exit uh, weight post milking. And are these scales daily calibrated? How are they kept? Calibrated and ac accurate. My experience is is that they 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 very seldom. Well, let me say the Efikim system uh, very seldom needed calibration. It was very we we would check that the weight was correct on a weekly basis, but very seldom needed to calibrate it. Uh, and and I'm talking now as the dealer of the of, you know of the system, we very seldom needed to calibrate. Mm -hmm. And um, how many farms in South Africa are running this system, do you, more or less? Uh, uh, over 300. Okay. Great. Now, I loved all of the wonderful pictures and comparisons with jerseys. Um, <laughs> just a random question. Are there a significant number of jerseys in South Africa? Um, what is the most common breed? Holstein, like everywhere else? Uh, uh, Holstein, uh, Holstein is the most do most dominant, but especially in pasture systems, there's a lot of of first and second uh, crossing, F one, F two crossing between Holsteins and Jerseys going on. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> can, coming up. Can I, sorry, can I can, can I ask Philip just to elaborate a little bit on? Uh, body condition score, timing of body condition scoring, and why it is so extremely important to get that right. Uh, also, uh, with reference to twins. So let me, let me make the first generalized statement, is that when we, when we speak to a client or when we're on a farm, we don't talk about body weight. We talk about body condition score corrected weight. And so, so we would want the, just to, just to make certain that we're under, you know, we're all understanding what I'm saying is that the cow of a, uh, let's call it a 600 kilo weight, which has now lost a hundred kilos is still the size, because when your body condition score her correctly, she's not a 500 kilo cow, she's a 600 kilo cow that must be fed as a 600 kilo cow with a condition score probably, you know, 1.75. I don't know what the exact maths are out of my head, but she's a, she's a very thin 600 kilo cow and you need to feed her as a 600 kilo cow, not a 500 kilo cow. What we've done, or the way we've implemented our system 
is that we want to condition score the cow just prior to calving down. That's our starting point of condition score, not post, no, not post calving. And then we would take day three to five average weight and make that combination as the ideal weight. In other words, body condition scored calving weight would be a, a condition scored just prior to calving and the weight just post calving. So the calf has no effect on that on that weight or condition in, in any way. Post calving, the calf is out. She, she's fine at, at that point in time. And then, and then we would like to have a situation where there's fairly regular condition scoring, somewhere around 40 days, somewhere around 100 days, somewhere around four to five months pregnant, and then, and then definitely at point of dry off. And, and the initial aim of the system was to ensure that when cows dry up, they dry up in the ideal condition score. Now, I don't want to get involved in the discussion of What's the ideal? You know, some countries will have a, a three and others will say 3.25 and three po- uh, uh, others will say 3.5. We've always gone with the basis of 3.5 is the ideal condition score. So that's been our aim to get 85, 90% of the cows that dry up into a condition score of 3.5 by use of the feeding system. N- nothing over, but that's where, we, that's where we want to be. And the more and the more the condition scoring that gets done, obviously the better more accurate the system will be. There's a benefit, of course, therefore, in having a, a, a camera that does condition scoring because it's, you know, there's daily accuracy coming through on condition that those, those cameras are properly, properly calibrated. Okay. Um, and, and, just, yes. and just uh, about the, what, the discussion we had the other day, uh, on nadir and fat cows and twins and uh, <coughs> how this system contributes to combating those kind of problems. So what we, what we have found is that the biggest problem that we have seen on almost all our farms, be they TMR farms or pasture farms, is the loss of weight that takes place in the dry period. And the consequences of that weight loss post, post calving are, are massive. So your calving, your, your dry up weight and your calving weight should be an equivalent weight and your condition score should be equivalent. So that's the first point to calibrate yourself according to, the, according to those numbers. Again, I'll say calving weight is, is day three to five average. If you've had uh, uh, um, massive weight losses uh, post-calving, you're able to identify who those cows are. And the system will, of course, feed those cows to get them to turn around as quickly as possible. In in the case of of, um, being able to identify uh, cows that are carrying twins, you're you're able to feed that cow a lot extra because she's carrying twins and to retain condition. In the normal course of events, if you didn't know that she had twins, she would not be able to dry up as a, as a, you know, in a good condition. And she would lose massive amounts of weight in the dry period because she's carrying the twins with a consequence, the negative consequences post calving uh, that come with that. So uh, that's now for her. It's bad enough that she's going to have a retained afterbirth and those negative consequences, but now you've got a weight loss as well. So that cow that's, ca- that's carrying twins, you're able to identify. If you're able to identify, you're also able to feed her. Ideally, you want to dry her up a little bit sooner, give her a little bit more time dry, let her, get into, let her retain or p- uh, hopefully gain a little bit of condition in the dry period. I'm not talking about weight, I'm talking about condition. And in, and in that way, give her the benefit. Uh, or, or, you know, of the feeding system. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to return, unless there's more discussion on this, I'm going to return to a couple of the questions. Um, questions and comments, I guess I'll call them. Um, there is a comment that, and uh, you mentioned the use of cameras, body condition score is subjective unless you use cameras um, or you have this, I would think having um, the same person doing the body condition score. 
Um, that is a pre- with- that's almost a pre- sorry to interrupt. That's almost yes. a prerequisite. And rightly or wrongly, what we have tended to do is get somebody off farm to come in on a weekly basis. Somebody who is coming in, let's say the feed rep who comes in on a weekly basis for a visit, he would come in and take the steam up cows and condition score those steam up cows so that you've got an independent eye looking at those cows. You know, let's call it, let's, let's call it independently. The assumption, of course, is that he knows what he's doing. But that's, what, that's, how, we, that's how we would ask our clients to, to go about it. Oh, perfect. That, that seems nice. Yeah. Um, let's see. And would this system work without milk meters? No, no, it can't be because you need the milk production and you need that milk production expressed as a percentage of body weight to feed accordingly. So no, you cannot do that. Yes. Um, so I'm going to cast, um, tackle a bunch of questions that were asked by Kenneth Bolter before he left. Um, First of all, he thanks you, Henry, for your presentation. And um, his first question is, you use energy-corrected milk in your sheets, which you use um, milk on your slides, therefore a different table for different herds for different objectives or milk pricing systems. Do you you adapt that depending on what the milk pricing systems are or objectives? Um, I think... I believe I've answered the question around, uh, around energy corrected milk. Uh, currently, we cannot do that unless you have something like uh, a lab system, which is right. real. So, well, that's out of the question. Um, um, well, there was a comment that box type milking robotics have butterfat and protein sensors that have real time corrected milk output reporting. Yes, but as Philip explained, this is not a system that's developed for uh, robotic systems. We didn't have even that in mind when we did this. This is purely for the management systems that uh, we have available in South Africa, and there's quite a number of them. Um, And like I've said uh, early on in the presentation, uh, it is not management system specific. Although I had Elpro on that farm, during that time, we wanted to do something that can be used in any management system. So maybe you can do it in a robotic system, but uh, we haven't tried that. We believe we have only one robotic system in South Africa, so we didn't do that, unfortunately. Concepts are the same. Yeah. Um, uh, can I can I can I yeah. chip in there? Yeah, I, I think that the I think that one of the constraints in the robotic system, w- from our point of view, would be to deal not necessarily with the butterfat protein. That's an easy part because we do allow energy corrected milk feeding. Uh, we we have installed uh, I have installed Effie Labs on a number of clients' farms. And so uh, uh, energy corrected milk uh, is, is easy for us to do. What we haven't done is deal with the fact that cows come in at, you know, at random time to be, to be milked. And therefore, how would we deal with that feeding? So that would be my answer. Yes, we could deal with a, we could deal with the energy corrected milk side of it because we already do. If it was online, there would be no problem with that. Uh, but the but the the randomness of the randomness of, of feeding would be something that we haven't dealt with. We'll talk, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the second part of that: Do you feed specific feed technologies to prevent acidosis? Some farmers on FF systems dose propylene glycol and other fractionated feeding, other yeah. fresh cow products, additional to the protein, energy, and mineral pellets. What is your view on this? Marion, can I just go quickly back to the previous one as well? Um, yes, please. South Africa is more a, a volume-driven country, uh, which is quite different from, from other countries. Uh, farmers all, also are paid on a percentage of butter, butter fat, for instance, and a percentage of protein and not um, total kilograms. So we manage that accordingly. I work with one dairy herd, which is paid a lot of money on butter fat. And then another herd, both jerseys, 
which is not paid a lot of money on butterfat. So we play it like that with, uh, well, what we've learned from all over the world, how you manage um, butterfat, for instance. So that's the one. The other one I know asked that question, and um, there's a whole lot of ways that you can do that because we feed such a huge amount of concentrates in South Africa, especially high starch concentrates, we need to uh, feed additives or medicaments for, for acidosis. So yes, we do that. Uh, but like I've said, and, I've, uh, and I think Tom will agree with me, maybe I don't know, but I think he will agree with me. If you do steam up uh, or if you do transition correctly, it is challenging to get cows into an acidotic state. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And, I, and I'm totally with you. Acidosis is a, is a late lactation cow, a low producing herd problem, not a high production problem. Yeah. I cannot remember when last I've seen uh, cows with acidosis very long time ago. And as I've mentioned on that, um, when I've showed that uh, uh, the menu, when we started off with this, there were some of these Jersey cows consuming 20 kgs of a 30% starch concentrate, 20 kgs. So that's a huge amount. And that's uh, like you, me, <laughs> I mean, I was scared at that stage that uh, I will kill cows, but nothing happened. So, and that's what totally set my mind in a, in a different, uh, right? So, yes. Um, so, yeah, and we, 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 we're not propylene uh, glycol, but yeah, some other stuff. Okay. And then the final question in this group is, can you share some experiences on feeding a pellet versus a meal product in parlors? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, you, you, you don't need pellets. You need exceptionally good pellets. Uh, if you don't have, a, and I, also Tom was with me on one of these farms where we had uh, quite bad pellets. And when you have bad pellets, with the, which is not very durable, you don't have, a, uh, you don't nearly have the intake that you need. The better the quality of the pellet, the better the intake. And then another thing, you need to make those pellets palatable. So I make use of uh, flavorants and um, uh, taste enhancers just to make sure that I get the consumption that I need. Because if you put, if you put um, 10 or 12 kgs of pellets per day in front of a of a cow in two meals, she need to consume it quickly. Otherwise it's a waste. One of these farms that I work with is twice a day milking and one of them three times. So three times, not that big uh, an issue. But if you push that amount of pellets in twice a day uh, or, or you know, twice feeding, that's, uh, then you need some very palatable and good pellet quality. Is that, it's the um, it's, that's the I'm same sorry, for, is that an automatic feeders? Yes, so it 20, is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I just can add my two cents worth? Uh, the, the more important point from the farmer's point of view is that he wants throughput of cows through his dairy. He wants the table to turn he, in, the, in the case of a rotary. He wants it turning as fast as possible to get milked as fast as possible uh, because he wants his cows to get back on, you know, out to the grass and he wants to go home. So he, he wants to feed a pellet because your intake is a lot faster. And, and that's why it'll, in, in our cases, it will always be a pellet situation. There'll, there'll never be a meal being fed. It's just too slow. Um, uh, unless there's more comments on that, um, the final, the question, um, final question that I have so far is maximum supply of concentrates in a parlor equals 60 kilograms per cow per day, two times a day milking, um, which I think we just discussed that it's different than that. So a variety, so in a variety of milk yields of 12 to 14 kilograms per day, how to feed very high yielding cows to prevent the low yielding cows becoming fat? And I think, go ahead, 
do that one. Well, the, that is the um, that is why we 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 do this uh, in the way that you set up the menu. That is how you combat over fat cows and underfed cows. So you have in you have for a specific farm a specific menu, and in that specific menu, which is not the same for each and every farm, you have a, a normal. Uh, menu and uh, then a part where you where the cow will be fed on uh, a menu for uh, when she's over fat or under condition so yeah, that is maybe one of the the biggest reasons why you will use that to combat it mm -hmm. for condition over fatness or under condition of yeah you know, for growth this uh, I mean, you can go back to that slide. There's a whole lot of a lot of reasons why you use that, but that is maybe one of the most important. Okay. Hey, I'll be cheeky. Mm. Yes, please do. <laughs> we love cheeky. <laughs> that arm, right? The, the the fifteen the fifteen kilo concentrate for the black and white cow is the eight kilo concentrate for the Jersey cow. I, I, I'm not, I don't correct me on the numbers, but I'm just making the point. So what, that's the whole benefit of feeding as a percentage of weight. It's not, it's not 16 kilos of concentrate. It's 1%, 2%, 2.5% of body weight, irrespective of her weight, of her body conditions called correct, corrected weight might be. Exactly. So that's why if you have, if you have, let's say you have a 30 liter group, but there's different cow sizes or cow weights in there, and you feed a flat rate there. That's where you will have fat cows and thin cows and a whole lot of other ways. In, you know, it's uh, it's that's why it's not working when you have uh, different cow sizes on the same milk production because you will overfeed and underfeed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I thought you would say. <laughs> so, um, do we have additional questions or comments that anyone would like to make? Because um, Heinrich has to take a nap because he has to answer questions at 1 a.m. in the morning for this 6 o'clock webinar. <laughs> a nap or drinks? I'm not sure which is happening. Both. Both. I hope so. All right, so like you know, people get hung up on this. How much? How much can these cows actually eat in the in the parlor like that? So, how? What's the um, on average, Philip? Um, how many minutes per milking is a cow on the table? Um, there are clients that have nine minute rounds, eight minute, nine minute rounds, and there are clients on pasture farms that have twelve minute rounds. Okay. So let's say 10 minutes. So that will depend. So, so let me answer it the other way around. We have a client who has a, um, a stanchion where, he, where each cow is individually milked you know, and then leaves. We have to feed the cow within four minutes. So you yeah. don't give her 16 kilos a day. You come down to 12 kilos a day or, or, or 10 kilos per day. And you're not giving her, let's call it 60, 50, 60% 60 of a concentrate. You're giving her only 30% of a concentrate. But that 30% is then relevant. So it, it, irrespective of the time that the cow spends within the dairy, parlor by parlor, we're able to feed her to make the best uh, of, the, of the concentrate that she, that she does get. Yep. Well, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to, 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 to make the point that, that okay, if we say ten minutes at just as, as an average number, um, and, and we know from robot herds, okay, this has been measured that these cows can consume with a good pellet, you know, they can consume upwards of five hundred grams a minute. Okay, so right there, you know, we have the potential ju just from from the from putting those two pieces together at 10 kilos a day, relatively easily, relatively comfortably knowing that they can do that. We work on around 630 to 650 grams per minute. Per, okay. a good pellet. And, and yeah, yeah, that, that's, I, I can see that as being feasible. Yeah. 
that's why you can you can easily feed up to 15 kgs three times smoking easy but can, can i just add a, a a critical point that we've kind of moved beyond uh, but it, it it's relevant only to a point because it depends who the farmer is we've convinced almost all potential clients we, we never sold a rotary we never sold a milking machine we never involved in that side of the platform all i did in my company was sell management systems but we almost always convinced a, a new client putting up a new dairy to put in a rotary system because it allows him to to mix energy, protein, minerals, and other goods in front of each individual cow, which you can't do when you've got a herringbone swing over kind of system as we have in the country. You're, you're kind of limited to one concentrate and maybe at a push two concentrates. The moment you go to two concentrates, you're looking at the same cost as a, the, the pre, then you're looking at paying the premium of, of a, uh, you know, of a rotary over a, a, a herringbone parlor. And, and, the, and therefore, the guys have always gone for rotary systems. And then you get the benefit of, you know, in absolutely individual feeding because you've, you've only got one point that you need to feed, not 60 or 80 or 100 points at which you need to feed, the, 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 you know, each individual cow. Cool. Exactly. Do we have more questions or comments? Thank you very much, Marion. And thank you. Everybody on the panel. Um, I'm hoping uh, we really enjoyed the addition of Philip, and I'm hoping he'll come again at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I if I do not pitch, uh, it's not because I don't want to be here, it's just because I could not get up. <laughs> We're gonna make Tom bother you. He he's going. <laughs> you ignore me. <laughs> well, Tom, yeah. you have ways. How can anybody ignore you? True, true that I can get other people involved. Yes, I'm counting on this. <laughs> well, will you take, will you take a glass of wine with me one o'clock tonight? <laughs> <laughs> which is your seven o'clock, which is smack down in, in your wine time. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You get funny, Heinrich. It's I've done these or I've done training sessions with Zoom, uh, especially with Asia. We get into the middle of the night and I'm usually sitting here with some sort of alcohol in my hand. I will send you I will send you some good bottles. Good, please. Well, maybe, maybe I need to come over in November and then bring him back with me. Oh, yes, please. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Hi, you can never travel from South Africa. We'll meet in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to do a culinary tour in Italy, so I'm, I'm in on that one. Okay. Sounds good. He's a wine snob, Elena, and he lives in the olive region of, of South Africa. So he's, and he's a foodie. He's a food snob. <laughs> he did mention that last time I talked to him. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, Thank you very much. Seriously. Thank you, we'll talk later. Yeah, seriously, Philip, if you're um, yeah. able to be awake, we would love to have you join us again this evening. Um, I will be sending additional information. We have the um, we have the Argentine join us in the afternoon, and they always ask lots of questions. So I'll do the best that I can. Terrific, terrific. Um, everybody, well, thank being you so awake, much. dealing with the Argentines. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Philip. All thank right. you, pleasure, guys. You. We'll thank see you, you tonight. Ciao. Certainly, Marianne. Um, Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, it was an excellent presentation, Henri. I really appreciated it. Um, I especially enjoy the systems thinking approach that our industry lacks in so many ways. Um, you've, I think you've taken this to a new level, which is outstanding. 
you know, and obviously the limitation is the willingness, especially in the United States, of dairymen to do the most rudimentary data capture, such as body weights, which is still very rare, unfortunately. Along that line, though, I, I have a question. Oh, one comment. Um, I applaud your approach to res restoring fertility starting in the transition window, which is when we advocate in our philosophy that her lac next lactation really starts. And we found tremendous benefit use supplementing in that window with essential fatty acids. Um, very few, if any, peer reviewed work, but a lot of clinical demonstrations and we've seen improved embryo quality, um, cows being super ovulated and flushed and just improved fertility overall, restoring fertility. So I'll just throw that out as a comment. Thank you but very I have much, a question. Well and good morning. Good evening Please. for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So here's my question. And I think you hinted at it, but may, I just wanted to wrap my head around it a little bit because there's a lot here. You mentioned body weight corrective, I think, for body condition. And I assume, and this is where I want to be corrected or understand, if I have a cow that's heavy, she's going to, she may weigh proportionately more than her ability to milk might be um, based upon dry matter intake predictions. Is a discounting taking place there so that a, she's discounted in her ability to make milk by reduced dry matter intake and consequently she's put on a diet that would promote loss of that excess condition. And when I say excess, I'm, I'm saying that three, five is your optimum and you're above that. It's excessive. And similarly, a low condition cow, I assume, is given energy to uh, supplement and return her to a, a, a normal weight. But I mean, the model would do that anyway, but especially the obese cow, because I think that's our big challenge in many situations. And she's the outlier, fortunately. She's not common, but they're there. Well, I think you summarized that correctly. <clears throat> and I will ask Philip just to explain the whole issue about body condition score and body condition corrected score. Uh, I think I've said a lot. Uh, I'll hand that over to Philip. But just, just one thing, and what is very important, I believe I've mentioned it in the presentation, is the difference doing individual feeding to a certain extent, because it's not uh, complete individual feeding, but uh, at least to, to um, address individual needs in the parlor opposed to group feeding or feeding on average. So the best way to explain that is when you have those two examples, let's say for a 500 and a 700 kilogram cow on the same milk production when they were in a group, let's say they in a in a 35 or a 50 liter group. So the needs for those two different uh, cow sizes or cow weights or frame sizes are completely different, which is common knowledge. But I mean, in the normal circumstances, you don't address that. So there's, first of all, um, lots of money to make when you address those individual needs correctly. And of course, um, things like reproduction, et cetera, et cetera, health, metabolic diseases, which you will also address. So Philip, maybe just explain uh, the concept of the body condition corrected weight. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, so the, the principle is that when you've got a 540 kilo cow at a 2.5 condition score with 3.5 as your ideal, uh, that's a 10% weight difference. So effectively, she's a 600 kilo cow. Sorry. I think we've lost his, um, his audio feed. Bill, can you speak? I'm here. Okay. All right. I'm not sure if he if if 
if Philip was done speaking or if we lost um, his audio. Uh, let me see if I can get hold of him. Yeah. He may not know that he's lost his. Right. Yeah, I right. think so. Because it seemed rather abrupt. Yeah. But okay. he, he's, ex he's talking about the discounting in the truest sense of the word discounting in terms of what, how, it, how body condition score impacts what her actual, her metabolic weight, I'll use that term, is going to be. And um, so, but that's, I'll stand by. Well, I'm back again. He's back. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I, my apologies beyond my beyond my control. Uh, um, so we only talk, and our clients on the main only talk about body condition score corrected weight. So w w we don't talk about the five hundred and forty kilo cow. We talk about the six hundred kilo cow, and and everything happens thereafter. The the way it works in practice is that we condition score the cows prior to carving down. So what I like to do, what I like to recommend the clients to do is get an independent person who's regularly on the farm, uh, maybe the feed rep, maybe the semen rep, on, who's there on once a week basis. He condition scores the steam up cows. So let's call, let's say every three weeks, we, um, no, for, for 21 days, the cow is in her steam up group. So she should therefore be scored uh, when she enters the steam up group and then for the next two weeks thereafter. So we've got a consistent uh, process of, of, of uh, scoring by an, an independent person who, who can score. And we hope that he can score correctly. Uh, so we use the condition score prior to carving. We use the weight of the cow from day three to day five as the average. And that we then call the, the, the carving weight. And we use that weight as the starting point of her, of her lactation. Um, so we have carving condition score corrected weight. We like to score again somewhere around 40 days in milk, somewhere around 100 days in milk. We definitely score again somewhere between four and five months pregnant and definitely at the point of drying up. We want to, be, we want to have the cow's condition scored again. One, just one little extra point. The, the weight at the point of drying off and the weight at the point of carving down should be the same weight and therefore the same condition score. What we find the most difficult thing to manage, what I see is the most difficult thing to manage, is the weight during the dry period. And, our, and, and what we most often see in our situation is the massive loss of weight in the dry period by many, many, uh, by many, many cows, uh, which is very difficult to control because it's not something that we can do with a scale. Uh, we don't weigh the cows. There's no benefit to weighing the cows over, over the dry period. So we have that conditions. We have the carving, we have the dry up weight. We have the carving weight. The difference between the two tells us how well we're able to manage that. And that's very difficult from a seasonal point of view. Sometimes the cows are putting on too much weight in let's in our uh, spring time uh, and then the cows are losing too much weight during this the autumn and winter time okay thank, thank you, you very much bill did you have more no i'm good for now all right thank you thank you for joining um i have a question and a comment um tim williams says thank you for an excellent presentation and in this herd, um, is the data consuming, and the herd, the herd and the data, are they consuming any pasture or just roughage as part of a, as a PMR? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I've mentioned it earlier on in the presentation um, that this herd is a TMR herd. So full-blown TMR, no pasture. And what we do is with the base mix uh, that you feed outside is to maintain a specific uh, milk production. So let's say in the case of um, uh, a Jersey herd, maybe anything from 15 liters to a 20 liter base mix outside, 
for different consumptions and then you top up in the parlor to reach your specific um, targets in terms of milk production, body condition, growth, etc. So this was, so what was fed outside in this case is a PMR, so all the roughage with a certain proportion of concentrate. So, uh, you, you know, everything protein and energy wise. Do you have some, some herds? Um, I think this morning we discussed that there are about 300 herds in South Africa on this system. Do you have some that are grazing herds and how, and if so, how do you account for that um, intake? Oh, come on, yeah. Tiny, give me a good answer. <laughs> ah, <Tom> <laughs> um, well, it is exactly the same. So whether you do this on a pasture herd or a DMR herd, the base mix outside uh, with pastures, that's the pasture. It is very difficult to determine the intake on pasture. It's we, I mean, we use calculations and certain assumptions. Um, and it's different from what you will see in Europe or maybe in the United States, but then you top up in parlor as well. So in many cases in South Africa with the pasture herds, uh, you will see a flat rate. And that's why I've mentioned the flat rate feeding. They will either feed a flat rate in terms of let's say six or seven or even less kilogram per cow per day, or they will do that for certain production groups, or they will feed as um, you know certain grams per liter. There is not that much uh, pasture herds that will feed on production. There is, and they do very well, but not a lot. Thank you. Good morning, Tom. Good afternoon. Good Good evening. Good morning. Evening. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, for I, was, me. I just finished mowing my lawn. <laughs> well, it's, it's about to rain, Tom. So good, good plan. Um, for the first time this year, right, Tom? Oh, go to hell, Proka. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for that, I'm I, just for that. I'm going to go over by the guineas and get them all wild, riled up. <laughs> Um, so as a follow-up, what percent of um, uh, percent liter weight concentrate intake, I think that's what, um, are pasture herds achieving versus PMR herds while maintaining room and health? Uh, um, Marion, just, can you just you, read? For, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm saying it right. Um, it's I, live weight. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Tim. <laughs> what percent live weight um, concentrate intake are pasture herds achieving versus PMR herds while maintaining room and health? Um, <clears throat> I've mentioned, I've also mentioned in the presentation that um, the amount of concentrate that these cows consume, especially fresh cow and high producers are sometimes scary, but uh, easily up to two and a half percent of body weight. So you can just calculate that on let's say a 500 kilo cow on pasture or calculate that on uh, a 700 kilo Holstein on a TMR system, not that much, maybe two to 2.2. .2, but easily up to 15, 70 kgs in parlor, either two or three times smoking. Well, I think you also hit on something really important there, Heinrich. When we look at, at the pasture cows that are in South Africa, they tend to be smaller frame size, correct? Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. Versus what I see a lot in South America and like that, where they are using uh, pure Holsteins um, and, and, and dealing with much bigger cows, chili as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are yeah. the pastured cows, and, do they tend to be, uh, heavier? Because that one picture in the opening slide, it looked like cows on pasture and their body condition score looked, um, pretty thick. I am just curious. I, I saw that and it just, I couldn't help but notice. 
there's two issues here. First of all, genetically, those cows should be like a uh, mature body weight of 700 to 720 kilos. Tom mentioned earlier uh, or, or with, with the first presentation that over time, we've seen an increase in body weight in um, uh, dairy cows or dairy herds. And uh, Philip can elaborate on that. He, he see the same thing. So let's say, for instance, I worked on a 460 kilo um, mature weight for jerseys. All of a sudden we see, no, it's not 460, it's closer to 500. And the same for Holstein herds on TMR. So I believe that the, that the uh, heifer rearing program and the lack of um, enough dry matter intake on pasture herds um, leads to cows that's only on a mature weight of 500 to 550 kilos. It's not the genetic um, mature weight. It is, um, uh, it is, I would say it's due to dry matter intake because they, <laughs> they just like, uh, you know, with calf rearing, um, which is, th there's, there's always a restraint on dry matter intake um, controlled starving, if you can call oh. it that, like with calf rearing. Tom will know exactly what I'm talking about. So, oh, so yes, it, that's it. That's what we call it here too. We drive past um, any herd on grazing and quite often they look like it is controlled, controlled starving. Often yeah, and done then, in organic herds. Philip, maybe you can say a word or two about the pasture herds and sizes and all that stuff. In, in my experience, what we land up having happen is that um, when you've got a fixed rate, when you've got a fixed feeding rate where every cow gets six kilos of concentrate or eight kilos or 10 kilos, whatever the volume is that the farmer chooses to feed uh, at a point in time, in the, in, because most, most of farmers uh, will have two seasons. So you'll start off with a, a flat rate, you know, a flat 10 kilos and then eight kilos a month or two later and then and you know six kilos a month or two later what we very clearly see is the growth in the size of the animal to to achieve mature genetic weight um, over time uh, because we're feeding we're feeding a lot better than a flat rate feeding uh, we, we've seen that in the weight growth and we've also had uh, um, um, height measures on rotary parlors that have given us that growth in height, actual growth in height of the of the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh lactation animals growing out to genetic potential. So there's no there's no difference in the genetics of a in in our case in many cases of the 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 pure Holstein animals might be different for uh, uh, New Zealand genetics or Australian genetics or whatever the case may be. If there's a genetic change in the animal, there might be a slightly smaller size difference. But what we've clearly seen on on the farms where we where we started feeding is that the clients got the increased production because we because they went in, onto our system and. Very soon thereafter, they realized that from a genetic point of view, they were not feeding their heifers correctly, and a greater emphasis got placed on heifer growth, which was outside what we were doing. But they realized that to have a, a better heifer growth would mean a, a, a larger animal at the point of uh, calving down in, in the first lactation, and therefore the growth. Uh, that would take place in, from, from lactation to lactation. Uh, in, in my client's case, uh, we're very clearly seeing uh, mature weights. I'm taking mature weight as the dry up carcass, or, or the dry up animal weight condition score corrected of a fourth and fifth lactation cow. I don't look at first, second, third lactations as that as that point. Uh, we've, I'm seeing an average of around 860 kilos carcass at as as mature weight size. Uh, that's an average size. That's not the extremes, you know, upwards or downwards. That's the average. Somewhere between 850 and 860 is mature weight in a TMR situation, 
there's very little difference on if they're using uh, the same genetic uh, as the TMR, there's very little difference in that mature weight on a pasture farm. Uh, and then, then the farmers are realizing that maybe there's a reason why uh, the, the crossing of animals uh, does make them smaller. Don't feed them smaller. In other words, starve them smaller. Actually genetically change the, 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 the package. Thank you. That, that's actually fascinating, Philip, because that, that's saying that they are not, that as heifers, especially as young heifers, they are not stunting them, that, that it's actually, they, they've just downregulated growth until they're fed better. That, that, that's quite different than what I would have anticipated. That, that's pretty impressive. Um, we had a comment Sorry, here. It, it, oh, Sorry, Tom. Sorry, sorry Mary. Uh, yeah. It's the biggest fight that I have with, a, with, with many clients is to convince them that what their cows actually weigh, with, because that's what I do. I, I, I get an average of the cows that dry up uh, fourth and fifth lactations, and I show him what his mature weight is. And it's very difficult to change that mental perception that an animal should carve at 600 kilos because you know, 85% of 850 is not 600 kilos. It's, it's a lot closer to 700 kilos. And therefore, he's, in his heifer growth, his target must be the 860 kilo mature weight. It's very difficult to change that mindset on that, on that farmer, that his oh. growth, his early, his early days of age growth should be according to that. So we... In, in a mindset point of view, I think that we do 1% per year. It doesn't change genetically uh, on, on, on many of my clients' farms. That 850 and 860 has been there for the last umpteen number of years. But to get the farmer to understand that he needs to grow out those heifers correctly um, is... is and, and, then, and then what you land up doing is you land up having overweight, over-conditioned animals at the point of carving, which cause problems in their own, you know, which we now identify, we're able to identify with milk weights post-carving as being the, you know, the, the over-fat animal causes a massive problem post-carving. Um, but that's what it tends to do. It tends to overfeed them late, late, late in, in, you know, in, in, in pregnancy and causing problems for the lactation when she does carve down. Thank you. God, I can't wait until travel opens up and I can come sit down with you and Heinrich and 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 talk for hours over wine and brandy. <laughs> we 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 look forward to you traveling too, Tom. Um, <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that. All my colleagues are like, please Tom, when are you gonna travel? <laughs> um, so we did have a comment from um, Paula's group in Argentina. Javier says the mature body weight is changing because the initial rearing and feeding system, mostly colostrum and milk intake in calves. So um, all the nutritionists are on board with this. Um, I want to um, shift gears a little well, bit. Let, let, me, let me jump in there, yeah, yeah. Marianne. Go. I, I, I'm going to say something very sad. Uh, I've been watching the videos of the new NRC uh, meeting last week. I mean, it's not going to come out until the end of the year, maybe. Uh, but they are assuming that mature Holsteins weigh 700 kilos. No. Yeah. Tom, Tom and that's a huge yes. problem. You will see, I, I'm not sure whether I've included in that summary uh, data slide of mine, but one of the things that we do is uh, what we get out of what the, the data um, uh, on that daily data basis. So, when you summarize that data for the different um, ages or lactation numbers, you will see that the average weights increase over time. You see that, so you have that data. So you can put that data back into AMDS and by doing that, formulate correctly. Um, and you will, we, we also, I have a, a report which show what is the target weights for the different lactation numbers. And uh, often, or all the time, when, you, when I look at what nutritionists are doing, they just will put in 460 for, for uh, jerseys. 
and 720 for all teams. And I think that's a worldwide thing that they do. They don't know what is the actual um, mature weight for the specific herd. Mm -hmm. uh, can I come in there? And, and, it's a, and it's a massive dilemma for me in analyzing the data for, for use of, of by the system is that when we enter a farm and he has some jerseys, some black and whites, and F1, F2, F3 crosses, is that what we see on the management system is cross jersey Holstein or Holstein jersey cross, whatever, however he's named it. And how do we then determine what is the expected dry off weight when we don't really have a genetic potential of that cow because she's a cross of some sort we, we you know we, we don't know from looking at the dart the, the the management software whether she's an f1 cross and f2 cross and therefore you, you know what is her actual potential uh, um, mature weight and because we're allowing for a growth of some sort a first lactation animal a second lactation animal we allow for some growth but we don't really quantify we can't quantify up front where that growth is going to go when she's gone from, and I'm taking especially a, a, a pasture farm uh, where we have so many variations running on the same farm, it's very difficult to determine what that end point is. And we try the best that we can on an individual basis, but we don't always get it right. You're absolutely right, Philip. And it's really the problem is more the F2s and F3s because you know, they, they don't milk as well as the F1s do, and, and they tend to, to get fatter. So it's really tricky to, 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 to figure that out unless the farm's got really, really good records on, on uh, what their breeding background is. Tom, I'll be cheeky again. Um, I got permission this morning to be yeah. cheeky. We don't allow cows to get over-conditioned, so we don't have that problem. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm, I would like to offer an opportunity for Marcos Neves Piera from Brazil. Um, Marcos, do you have comments or questions? Hi, I am Marion. Can you listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thanks again for, for the invitation. Uh, hey, I found it very interesting that you're using PMRs and concentrating the parlor for big herds. And your feed tables are basically rely a lot on, on body weight. Could you describe a little bit better how you get the body weight data? Like I, I've asked this question here before, I think. Like are you using scales or what frequency do you use or you just predict body weight? Or what are you doing, girth perimeter? How, how is it a, your practical approach of getting body weight from each cow in, in such big herds? Philip, it's... Uh... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll answer, I'll answer it uh, from my point of view. I was the African dealer in Southern Africa and every client, we, we convinced every client to buy a walkover scale. So when she, when she exited the parlor, every single cow, every, every milking, either twice or three times a day, would walk over a scale and we, we had the weight of the cow at every single milking. Um, in, in, in South Africa, it's now become uh, the norm, irrespective of management system, for the farmers to buy a scale and make use of a scale. Uh, in, in, in our situation, we could convince a farmer milking, and, uh, and, and I must admit that the data is 10, 11 years old now, uh, um, at least, we could convince a farmer at that point in time who was milking more than 300 cows that it was financially viable to, to, to buy a walkover scale. I, I can only talk about South African finances from that point of view. Um, from a small, from a small farm, farm point of view, 300 cows was the, was the minimum amount to justify the, the scale or the highly premium or highly inflated value that's put on a scale but it's a management system the management system would we would expect the management system to have 
the walkover scale, we would expect the client to have uh, milk meters in place and to utilize those two systems uh, to get milk as a percentage of body weight. We did uh, install AFI labs, which gave butterfat protein readings in line at every milking. So we were able to feed uh, energy corrected milk, fat corrected milk, energy corrected milk uh, on, on, on a number of farms. Um, but that's not the norm necessarily. But in, in our case, the norm was every single client water scale and milk meters. And how can I, can I ask another question? Yeah. For please. example, if you if you had to choose some points during lactation to weight a cow, like to get uh, good body weight, you like assume you don't have a, a scale that would do it every day. But well, when would you would you do that? Like, what would be your weighting points, for example? I would definitely want calving weight and a condition score at calving weight. I would then start to weigh at 20, 30, 40 days in milk. I'm taking each one of those points as the weight point because depending on how well you're getting your feeding will determine when the nadir is in the, in the weight graph. So will she reach the lowest point at 20 days in milk, 30 days in milk, 40 days in milk? And that will vary anything up to 60, 70 days in milk. So I would have at least a, every 10 day point uh, up until 100 days in milk and get your, your variation between cows somewhere along that line. I would then weigh cows uh, um, four, four months pregnant and def definitely at, at uh, um, um, drying off point. Those would be the points as a minimum to be able to to see what's happening to the cow's weight. And then of course, I would like to have a condition score at each one of those points as well. Okay, Th thanks Marianne. Uh, thank thank you. you, thank you for attending. Um, Henry, I, I wondered if during your analysis of both production and, um, and, and maximum ability with um, efficiencies with the cows, did you look at emissions and excretions? No, no, Marion, we didn't, no. I'm, I'm interested to think that the um, precision feeding might have some real um, value from that aspect. Yeah, no, you're right, but uh, we haven't done that. No, not yet. Okay, all right. Put um, that on a Trello card, Marianne, and we can come back to it in, in a couple yeah. of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think it's going to be very important. Um, so, um, uh, gentlemen and um, and Paula and Paula, I um, I am out of questions. If we thank you, are, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can go to bed now. Um, thank you. <laughs> I really, really appreciate um, all of our, all of our South Africans for joining us in such such a at such a time, um, and everybody always. Um, thank you, Tom and and Bill for for joining in, and and Paula and Paula always thank you, and Marcos. I appreciate your 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 attendance from from um, coming in from Brazil. So. For everybody, thank you so much for coming. And if I don't have more comments, I will go ahead and shut down the meeting. All right. Thank Bye you very much. Thank you. Bye, Hyman. Thank you. Thank Sleep you well. So much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Philip. Thank it's almost you. time for you to get up, isn't it, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Marcos. Bye-bye. Bye, Tom. Bye, everybody. Bye, Paula. <laughs> <laughs>